Today we are going to talk about ending an addiction. And we are not going to talk about just any addiction. We are going to talk about ending your addiction. And the addiction I'm talking about is addiction to oil. I'm going to demonstrate to you that there are ways to solve this problem. But first, let's talk about what does oil do for us? What does it do? Well, we all know that oil is a polluter of water with spills and other disasters. And it's the number one polluter for our air as well, particularly here in Southern California. But how big? How big is the oil toll? Well, here in California, for example, 74% of all emissions and all pollutions come from oil. 66% of greenhouse gas emissions come from oil. Look at coal, under 2%. Surprised? And not only that, oil is six times more expensive than any other fuel. We spend more than $600 billion a year in this country to buy oil and oil products. So would you say to me, hey, maybe we should use alternative energy. Solar, wind, maybe this would be a good solution. Unfortunately, we fuel our car with this. And solar and wind produce this. We don't fuel our cars with electricity. We fuel our cars with liquid fuels. Solar and wind, unfortunately, cannot provide liquid fuels. So what can be done? We can increase fuel economy. We can do public transportation. There are many solutions. Let's review them. So our president, signed, President Obama, signed the new CAFE standard, Corporate Fuel Economy Standard, which means that new cars are going to be so much more efficient than existing cars that you drive today. And over the next 10 to 15 years, we are going to see cars that are going to be incredibly efficient. However, when are you going to change your car? How about public transportation? Unfortunately, we live in a country that is not built for public transportation. We have urban sprawl, and between the two coasts, we have gigantic amount of open land that is found by people that need to drive very long distances. So public transportation is forever doomed in the United States to be a niche solution for large um, um, metropolitan areas. Maybe we can tax carbon, tax oil. Maybe we can change the pricing structure and then change the motivation of people to move away from oil. Well, we actually have done that exercise. When the Kyoto Accord was signed, oil was under $20 a barrel. Today, it's over 100. It's a 400% increase in price. If I would have gone to somebody and said, we are going to put a 400% tax on oil, people would say, wow, nobody would use oil. What happened since then? Oil consumption went up by more than 20%. So what we realize is, hey, without the opportunity to replace oil, people would just have to use oil. So taxation is not going to make a difference in usage. But it does make a difference. When the price of oil went from $20 a barrel to $100 a barrel, something did happen. That happened. In 1988, we had 18 million American families on food stamps. Today, we have over 47 million families on food stamps. And this is after a compounding growth of the GDP of more than 3% through that period. Why is that? is because oil is an incredibly regressive tax. And when you live in an environment that it only takes 6.3 million people to decide who is the president, you can see that it's politically toxic to increase the burden 
on the poor and the middle class. So taxation in reality is not a solution for us. How about electrification? Well, I love my Teslas, I love my son. Electrification is a fantastic solution. However, even if we grow the number of electric cars by a whopping 33% every year, because the base is so small, and the amount of cars we have in this country is so big, even within a decade, we are not going to get more than 3 or 4% of cars, electric cars. Not enough to make a gigantic impact on oil demand. Which brings us to alternative fuels. I mean, more particularly, replacement fuels. And these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Can we make replacement fuels that are better than oil for the environment? Can they be less expensive than oil and compete with oil in the market without government subsidy? And how long is it going to take to make a big impact? Because if we wait, we may as well wait for electric cars. So here is the key. The key is to find fuels that can work on your car that drove you here today. Because if we can replace the fuel that on these cars, we can kickstart the process of fuel replacement. Turns out that we have such candidates. Alcohol fuels are high octane fuels used today for racing. And with a little bit of coating, it can work in your car. But you ask me, Ayal, you kidding me? What about food versus fuel? We've all seen this graph that shows the perfect correlation between the price of, of uh, ethanol, for example, and the price of food. Well, this is something the oil companies will not want you to see. I added the price of oil to this graph. What are we seeing here? The price of oil is also determined by the price of alcohol. Wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Of course, the price of oil is not determined by the price of alcohol. Today, we live in an environment that energy is the number one input for agricultural production. When the price of oil goes up, the price of all agricultural products goes up, including up the price of corn, including the price of ethanol, and including the price of the whole food, food, food chain. And alcohol can be made from many different things. You know, we, we know that we can make alcohol from corn. We can make alcohol from trash, an alcohol called methanol. You can make alcohol yourself with a biodigester. How would you like to do that? Make your own fuel. However, a very, very promising feedstock to make fuel is natural gas. You can make alcohol fuels from natural gas. This is natural gas. But what about fracking? Right? Here's the reality of fracking. What we have seen two, three, four years ago about fracking is no longer the case. Fracking today is dominated in oil production. Okay, so more than 90% of new oil wells use fracking. And what does that mean? It means that choosing to do nothing is choosing to stay with oil. It's a choice. And if you're staying with oil, you're supporting fracking. Okay, I'll say it again. You today support fracking because you choose to stay with oil. Turns out, though, that when you frack for oil, you get a byproduct. And what is that byproduct? It's natural gas. And what do they do with the natural gas when it's a byproduct and you have a very expensive oil and a very cheap natural gas? They flare it. And this is the picture of the Bakken oil shell from space. And you can see that it's just as bright as Chicago. 
But alcohol fuel has many other advantages. They dissolve in water, and they are biodegradable. So if Exxon Valdez would have carried alcohol and ran ashore, nobody would have cared beside a few drunken fish. <laughs> it's small molecules, so it reduces smog. And it replaces a, a compound that exists in your car today. It's an aromatic called toluene. It's between 25% and 35% of the content of the fuel. This is a known neurotoxin. It's in your fuel today. It can replace it. And because it's higher octane, you can get much better fuel economy. And if you get much better fuel economy, you can get lower greenhouse gas emissions. And if you get lower gas emissions, all of a sudden you have something to talk about. But that's not the only thing. You can make, it, you can make the fuel, not just from natural gas, you can make it from many renewable sources. A recent study done by MIT has shown that just by converting existing engines to alcohol fuels, you can increase miles per gallon by 10 miles per gallon on the average. And here's they list the technology to do that. So if we look into the future, what we are seeing is this. Once you introduce a change in a system that has not changed for almost 100 years, you open up the system for innovation. People can come up with ideas. Americans are great at that. Can improve technologies. Look, we know these alcohol fuels don't suck. They don't suck because NASCAR runs on alcohol fuels. <laughs> we can get with alcohol fuels reduction in greenhouse gas emissions at the same order of magnitude that electric cars can give us. And we can start today. So how come when you drive your car, if anybody has a flexible fuel car, how come you get such lousy performance? We've seen that on the message boards, you know, you get lousy performance on alcohol-driven cars. The answer is simple. The car companies never optimized your car to run on alcohol fuel. It optimized the car just for gasoline. We took these cars, we optimized them to run equally on gasoline and alcohol fuel, and we got more than 20% improved fuel economy. And this is existing cars, existing engine technology. We didn't put any of the MIT stuff there. And how difficult was it to do? It was surprisingly easy. The software was already there. We had to turn on a feature. Many cars on the road today are capable of being flexible fuel cars, can work on alcohol fuels. The feature is turned off. So here's the decision we have to do, we have today. We can start on a path to a lower carbon future today. The question to you is, why wait? Come join the revolution. Join our movement. We are releasing a movie called Pump on September, in September 12, and then after that we are launching as an Hero X, which is an X Prize campaign a million dollar campaign for the team that can build the most effective design for alcohol car conversions. Thank you. <laughs>